Welcome to a special episode of the Central Pennsylvania Music Podcast, featuring comedian Earl David Reed. And welcome to another Central Pennsylvania Music Podcast exclusive interview. Tonight, we have a legendary comedian, Earl David Reed. You might know his voice from 105.7 The X. If you're from New York, you might know him from some of the other radio stations, but you definitely know him as one of the most iconic stand-up comedians, especially from our area. Join me as I sit down with him and get to know a little bit about his life and what he's done with his career. Without further ado, let's get right to it. And we are sitting down with the legendary Earl David Reed. I've been a fan of you for a while, so thank you so much for taking the time to come down and sit down with us, man. Well, it's finally uh, great to meet my fan. <laughs> I <Good> appreciate it. <laughs> hey, um, have a good one. <laughs> I, I got to tell you, this is great. Um, you know, being with this, um, the CPMAs, and it was one of these things that I just got involved with as far as uh, being the red carpet guy. And I got to tell you, I never really knew how big the music scene was here in Pennsylvania. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, I knew there were bands and you look around your thing. They're playing here. They're playing here, playing this. But when you go to this award show, you it just amazes me the, the number of bands there. And now some of these bands have become in, into my head, like uh, Jess Zimmerman, friend with Jess Zimmerman, yep. Amber Nadine, you know, Hot and Dangerous, all these people. It's just it's, it's great to see all this really good music. Absolutely. Which I, which I think is good, too, because I think people are losing that feel of going out and seeing live entertainment anymore. Everyone's stuck with their phone. Yeah, it's, you know? it's true. I mean, and also, I mean, without diving down too deep down the rabbit hole, but I mean, the ticket prices of certain things and uh, certain places where you can go see, they're not really helping that either because no. th they're way too exorbitantly expensive for the common person to go see. Right. Um, so, I mean, like I said, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole, but I, I, I agree with you. And I no, also let's think do it's it for a second here. Look, okay. here's the thing I think that's interesting about that is – um, you know, you got a lot of these bands that are, are really big and, and they have the huge prices and stuff and everything. Yeah. Like if you want to, even like with a football game yeah. or, 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 a, or like a concert, or anything, I think that's what brings out the, the local si the scene here is I think more that for the most part, it's pretty reasonable to go see yeah. local bands and good talent. You don't know who you're going to see. You don't know how great they're going to be in a year from now because the business is funky as all hell. <laughs> True. So you might as well go out and check out some of these things locally at a, at a decent price. I think it's great. You, you know, what? I didn't even think about that, but, you, but you're right. It's like, oh, well, why would I pay all of this money, like essentially break myself for one show when I can just go see this other show that's probably going to be just as good much more reasonable and probably at a venue that's way more intimate rather than a giant stadium where you're probably not even going to be able to, depending on what seat you can afford, you might not even be able to see the person really that's performing that you paid all that money to go see. Well, that's where the cover bands come in now. That, now, see, back in the day, when I'm I'm older than hell. Uh, just, I'm old, a lot older than you. Ah, I don't even want to, I'll tell you how old I am. Guess how old I am. 48. Ah! <laughs> you're welcome. My birthday's next month. Oh, well, I can't say that. We don't know when this is going to be shown. Uh, let's just say this. I'll have a birthday someday, and Perfect. I will be 63 years old. Shut up. Absolutely. You are 62 years old. 60, yeah. I'm completely gray on the inside, but, but um, dude. I look like a peach going bad. But in any case, I think I, I – uh, yeah. You know, so I, I just take care of myself. That's the best thing I can do at this point. Yeah, because I'm going to be honest. You definitely don't come off or look or act like a 62-year-old that – I've, that I've seen. Listen, I don't mean to brag, but I've had some twenty-something-year-old girls hit on me at the gym and stuff, you know, and because I natural bodybuilding and everything, and so they come up and they're like, ah, oh, everything. They go, oh, you know, you want to go out sometime? I go, well, how old are you? And they go, oh, twenty-five. I go, oh, what, what, what's your mother look like? You know, <laughs> <laughs> does she got big boobs like you? Because then we'll do something. I'll keep it in the family. <laughs> But um, it, it's one of those things where it's like, at this point, okay, so get back to it. I'm yeah. old enough to remember back when they used to call them impersonators. They used to be Elvis impersonators. Yeah. They were impersonators. And then everything, as the world becomes more correct and everything, everyone became a tribute artist. Yes. You know? And uh, and then that took off. Yes. And then it got to be a point where, okay, now we're going to tribute you even though you're not dead, which I still don't understand that that thing. Y yeah, I could see that. I that makes that me argument. feel a little funky. But going back to the ticket prices and everything, now this is the closest you can get to, uh, you know, to actually being there. It's Ex like it's like like porn. But it, perfect know? example, <laughs> dead. I mean, yeah. it, like if you, I mean, yeah, My Chemical Romance is still a thing. But like, are you gonna pay the ticket to go see My Chemical Romance, or if you're here locally and they're playing a show 15 minutes down the road, you can go see Dead, who absolutely murders their performance. Right. 
I'm just going to go see Dead. And odds are, Dead is probably going to play all of the songs that you actually want to hear anyway. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be for an eighth of the price. And it's going to be a way better performance because you're going to be right there at the stage. Like, I mean, I I agree. But I I never thought about it, though. Like, It is kind of weird. It's like if you're tributing a band that's still alive. Well, that's the thing. And I don't know whether the people, because, you know, when you get into music and stuff, like if you go to Nashville, half the buildings, Abscap buildings, you know. True. uh, But, but. I don't know whether if you do that and the person is still alive, do you still have to pay them something for being, for using that that thing? I mean, because you're basically yeah. being them. So I'm wondering if they have to give you something. I, I do believe you still have to pay if you're making, as long as you're making money off of their intellectual property. Right. There has to be some kind of royalty paid, but as long as you're not using their intellectual property, you should be fine. Right. I, I'm not a lawyer, but. That sounds correct enough. I, uh, that's enough legal jargon out of my mouth for the night. Well, it's, it's funny because, you know, you look at some of these, and music is funky. Uh, you can hear a song that's a long time ago, and then all of a sudden it comes back, um, uh, 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 Sweet Caroline. Oh, yeah. You know, and and by the way, this is going to sound horrible, but white people love that song, okay? <laughs> if Especially you if they If a group of white people ever chasing me, and I'll just sing Sweet Caroline, and when they go to bomb, 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 then I'll run, run, run. Because that's, a, and don't think I don't have the cha-cha slide Okay, okay, or Margaritaville in my back pocket as a backup. But I'm telling you right now, it's, but it's funny. Neil Diamond is probably, he's like 900 years old now. Yeah. And he's, he's probably sitting there going, now they're singing the song. You know? I put all that work in years ago for it to be huge now. Now it becomes kind of an anthem sort of a thing. But it's just so, it's, it's funny how the music industry just changed. Like, I can't, I, as much music as I've been around, I can't recognize it. Two times in my life, I've actually, I was in, uh, Fort Myers, Florida, um, uh, past December. Yeah. And, um, so I'm getting ready to leave and I have the, the, the big, uh, 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 car to load the stuff in to take me out. And there's a car sitting in front of me and the guy sitting in front of the car and he goes, Hey bro, you know, I'm just, you know, Hey, I don't mean to get in your way. Very polite guy. Yeah. So, um, he says, I'm just waiting for my guys to come downstairs. So I say, okay. So I run back upstairs to get my stuff to come down in the car. So I come down in the elevator. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I end up in the elevator with uh, two of the guys from Suicidal Tendencies. Okay. okay. Yeah. Now, I'm not going to be able to recognize them or anything. Yeah. But we're sitting there, and the guy says to me, uh, we're in the elevator. We're going down. He goes, you look like somebody important. And I go, you look like somebody important. So he gives me his name, and I give him my name. I said, when you have time, let's just Google each other, you know, <laughs> and just to figure it out. So it was funniest thing. And then I went back and Googled him. I went, oh, okay, because I did radio for a while, and we used to play them all the time. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's, it's just interesting to see, to be out and about and to run into a lot of these bands and, and seeing them live that lifestyle and everything. So it, It's funny, too, because I know exactly what you mean. Not to that level, but, like, it's like if you were in a band, like, especially a band like in me and Chris's era. Mm-hmm. We're grown up now, right? But if you look and you see in the you see in the mall, right? You you can tell like, oh, that dude either was in a band or is still currently. You just I, I have to look at you for two seconds. I'm like, you're in a band, and yeah. people that aren't in bands like they don't understand how we do that. I'm like, it's just the thing, man. Like we just know. It's- well, it's it's funny you mention that because um um I played um I have coming up again at the end of the year, uh Mickey's Black Box in Lidditz. Which is a Love phenomenal place. Love that venue. Um, so the um, so Greg uh, um, is it was it Shaney Enterprises. He's the promoter. Mm-hmm. He says I'm gonna invite you out to see this place. So since you're gonna play it, so he invites me out to see um, uh, Kicks. Okay, yeah. Okay, now Kicks is a huge deal. Yes. I, I didn't know they were that big of a deal. Oh, yeah, they're, they're so big. I, I go, <laughs> and they've been around for everywhere. So yes. I'm going there and I'm seeing there. So I go up and I. I sit in the balcony and I'm watching them. And these guys have to be like close to 70 years old. <laughs> yeah. And I thought to myself, you know the hardest thing about being in, in, in an old time rock star? People say it's losing your voice. I said, no. I think it's keeping your hair. I think that makes the whole bit of You see David Lee Roth now? Yeah, especially if you were big during hair metal. If you're a hair like, band. If you're a hair band. It says hair in the name of it. It says hair in the name. You got to have it. You got to do, you know, that's why they don't do all this stuff anymore because exactly they go, right. listen, they go after this and they hire someone else and go, can you all collect that, collect all those hairs that just flew out of my head? We got to go to like Kansas or something the next day. And got to so tape them back on. Yeah, it's <laughs> so funny to be able to, to go out there and I watch that and I saw these people and I go, 
it just never leaves you. The cool thing about music, and people says, what music do you like? Now, I used to do radio at the, at the X yep. yeah, here, and then I used to do country radio for a while, too. And I realized something about music after all these years. What song's the best song? Good music is, is, is music that reminds you about something or a time in your life. Absolutely. And that's what it comes down. When you hear a song and you go, I remember when, um, you know, I was dating so-and-so and I heard that song. Yep. That's the songs that are, that are really good. They now, you. if you want to compare old stuff to new stuff now, that's all relative. So. Yeah, exactly right. And I, you're not wrong. I, I can say the same thing. When I was younger, I mean, I was like strictly a metalhead. I was like, mm -hmm. I only listen to metal. It's the only thing that will ever have my heart. Now, some of that is still rang true. Like, metal is still like where my heart is. Right. But through doing this and being involved with this organization and being involved with this podcast meeting, especially the younger generation of musicians that we have, interviewing some of the most prominent musicians that we have right now, I can tell you right now, I the one thing that I learned is that my – I've learned to listen with my heart rather than right. my biases. And yeah. it's like, and like you said, if it speaks to you, if it connects to you, like then I determine on my own level, if that music is good to me or not. Yeah. And I think, I think a lot of people could learn to do that too, is just kind of just listen to music like, yeah. and just listen for what it is. I, I think that takes time. It does. Because you have the buildup of history of some nostalgia in your life to be nostalgic. OK, mm -hmm. so, I mean, when you just go out and you hear something and it has a beat or something like that, that's when people go back and they hear like like disco or Saturday Night Fever or something like that. They go, um, y you know, they remember something of that time or whatever. Yeah. You know, so it's just one of those things. I think you if you live long enough, that kind of builds into you. Now, it's basically stuff that you hear that you know, is really cool or what the radio stations play there to lead you believe what's supposed to be cool. Yeah. And, um, you know, and that's a whole different other thing there. So I, I'm right there with you, though. Yeah. I, I have that argument all the time, even mm -hmm. though I love all the radio hosts that we've had on yourself included. You've been a radio host. But, but yeah, I agree with the same thing. It's like, yeah, the, the radio kind of tells you what's good. And I'm like, mm, it's, yeah, it's debatable on certain uh, certain things. Um, yeah. Like you said, we could go down a whole different route with that. Yeah. Well, um, plus, as a side note, and that's what's what happening now. Now when you have, like, like for perfect example, I have my, my phone, and everything that I want to know is in my phone. Mm -hmm. When you're a radio station now, as a side note, I think they have to hire right now by personality because now it's not you waiting to hear Metallica, Yeah. okay? You know, you don't have to wait because Metallica is in your phone. That's you got to get the people you like to tell you to wait for Metallica, and then they wait for it and they listen to you. I don't think radio st radio still thinks it's the music and it's them. I don't think they take any uh, um, solace in, in um, personalities, but that, I think it's bigger than the music at this point. I, I couldn't agree with that. That, yeah. that. that honestly makes a lot of sense and it tracks mm -hmm. for sure. So, I mean, like like we're talking about, you've been a radio host, you've done a plethora of things, but you're primarily known for your stand-up com comedy. Um and you have been doing that for quite some time. I, I just kind of want to get back to like the foundation. Like, how did the name Earl David Reed? How did Earl start? Where where does your story start? Well, actually, it started off as Earl Reed, and I had to go to Earl David Reed because of SAG. Someone else had Earl Reed, so oh. I went with Earl David Reed, which is my middle name. Okay, and uh, and I use that name now. And the funny thing about th that, as a side note, with a name, is like, and if you're in music. Your music, you're in a band or something like that. You can never, 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 because it almost coincides. Because most musicians want to be comedians, most comedians want to be musicians, and uh, not wrong. You never promote enough. If you're thinking of doing it too much, then that's the time for you need to do it more. Because I gotta tell you, I can't tell you how many times I've been to Vegas and saw my name on the sign that says Earl David Reed, and people still go David Earl Reed. They still do that. They go David Earl Reed. I got James Earl Jones one time. I got James Earl Ray, which was a little offensive. Um, <laughs> you look at your history. Um, yeah. It was just one of these things where you can't, you have to make sure you're out there and you're promoting enough. But I started, I'm from Connecticut originally. Okay. So I started at a, a comedy club, and basically I used to um, watch the door at the comedy club. And then I kind of jumped up on stage, and it's like anything else. You know, I said, if I can do this enough where I can make, some money doing it, then I will decide to do that. Um, meanwhile, everything that's happened to me in my life has stemmed from being able to do stand up. Now, I've done Tonight Show, a bunch of other stuff in, yes. in, in, in Vegas and everything. Um, but getting into radio and doing the music um, it was because I was a stand up comedian. Because back in the day, when they're putting shows together, they go, We need a lead guy, we need a funny guy, and we need what they called back then the news girl. I know that's fully not fully correct now. Yeah. The, the, the news girl is yeah. what they said. And back then, you were on from five to nine, six to 10, whatever. And the funny guy 
just came in at five, was funny, and then went home at ten. Did nothing else. So it was easy. Yeah. So that <laughs> as as it went on and people had to become more viable and these radio stations or whatever, you had to learn a bunch of other stuff. You know, Makes sense, like yeah. I had to learn how to run a board and all this other kind of stuff, which was an um, which was was unfamiliar to me, but I kind of have that skill. Um, my only problem with radio is I think I did it too long. I was blessed enough to be on a show that was 15 years before I left. Yeah. Okay. And in reality, I probably should have done that 10 years and left after that because okay. in the last five years is when people start coming to me, uh, uh, comedic wise and TV wise to do stuff, and I turned it down to do radio. So I blame nothing. Um, um, but myself for that. You yeah, know, I'm not complaining that radio wasn't good. It was good to me. Um, it it you know it pulled my ass out of the fire a whole bunch of times. Uh, it Absolutely. helped me develop a following. Um, th through it. Oh my God, yeah. Yeah, and so I think the cool thing about it was, um, it it, it was just a good thing to be able to do as far as as far as uh, uh music was concerned. But comedically, you know. Um, I started off at this place called the Treehouse Comedy Club, which was in Westport, Connecticut. Okay. And Westport, Connecticut was probably about um, maybe roughly about an hour and a half from the city. Okay. So anybody that was anybody that worked in the city lived in this part of Connecticut. Okay. Like Letterman lived there and Gene Wilder lived there. Rodney Dangerford lived there for a while. And he used to go and show up at the club every wow, once in a okay. while. Wow, okay. So um, back in the day, um, I was sitting there and I would go and I'd watch the door. And uh, one night uh, before he got Jeff Foxworthy uh, was at the club. <laughs> and then I sat and I talked to him because there was a beginning for everybody. Oh, for sure. And I sat and I talked to him for a while and he was telling me about this and about joke structure and, and, and you know, what not to say and, and what not to, to, to do and how you structure a joke and what's good to talk about and stuff. It, and that whole way of thinking comedically has just changed at this point. Uh, yeah, and I think at this point now, if you come see me perform, um, I just after all the years of doing it, I just I'm just being myself. So it's not a matter of how long you want me to do. It's more or less how long you want me to stop. When do you want me to stop? Yeah, because now I'm just in there and I'm in my element and stuff. And so it's become a part of me. And I always tell people that are trying to do comedy and everything. I said, listen, until you find out who you are, your jokes aren't going to matter. You're going to sit there and write your jokes, but until you find out who you are. You're not going to be able to perform uh, the fraternal National Fraternal Order Police Convention and then go back and play like chuckle rumps the next week. Yeah. You know, so it's you have to be until you find out who you are, you'll be able to determine, uh, be able to perform in a bunch of different audiences. Because like a lot of people come out and they go, well, I got an act. So what do you have? OK, I got let's say you got 40 jokes. And they'll go out to whether it's the, the, uh, a bunch of nuns compared to a bunch of bikers compared to, like, um, um, I don't know, the Whitaker Center. And they'll ram those same 30, 40 jokes down your throat without knowing that, listen, that group might not like these jokes. You might yeah. have to take 20 from those jokes, maybe 13 from these jokes over there. And so I think it just comes down to having to structure it all. And that's the part that, that takes up most of the time comedically. But since I was there in Connecticut, I got on stage as much as I wanted. They would bring... Um, people in and uh, uh, and uh, I was like, well, hey, do you want to open for them? So they would throw me up there and a couple of times I got an old school picture of me and um, um, and Jay Leno, which is really weird. And because uh, I remember seeing him again and showing him that picture and um, uh, on the show. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. 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 That's that's, so that's got to cool. be such a cool feeling you know? and experience. And it's funny when you come back and you have kind of a history with some people, you know, and um, but as far as the performing is concerned. I mean, I love it. I love performing in the theaters. I, I went out and I just decided to be more of an individual with it because now there are a lot of big name comedians that go out and they do these comedy shows. But if you're not that big of a name and you go out there, you have to have a perception. You have to give people. So I went out. If you come see me at a theater, I have a huge stage set that looks like a big construction site. Okay. And um, there's a place called uh, a, a guy named Star who works for Concert Illusions. He designed my stage set. Okay. He's also done some for like um, 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 Kevin Hart and a bunch of other stuff. Okay. And he does, so he has, so I have a big stage set and stuff. And and I've gotten some gigs just for the fact that people look at me and go, they'll look at the thing and go, we'll take him. And they go, well, we don't even see him. Well, he's got all that. He must be pretty good. So <laughs> they look awesome. at it and they go, okay. And you go up there because they go, what guy's going to invest in all of this stuff? 
and and, and has like that. terrible jokes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> he so, bombs every night. <laughs> so you become you become that that person and that individual. You give your your act and yourself a personality. You're not just telling jokes. Because yeah. when they put you on a big stage like that, and you're not like Seinfeld, people have to go, okay, that guy's not Seinfeld. Why do I want to go see that guy? That makes sense. Okay? Yeah. Why do I want to see him? And so now you have to go. Okay. Well, you can run clips and everything, and now people can. Google you or YouTube anything before they even go see you. It's true, you know, which is good and bad. I mean, it has something, but the, you know, you know, I, I I would never go see anybody off of a two minute, three minute clip. I mean, I I just would go, hey, let me just go, and and see it. But yeah. now people are skeptical now because am I talking too much? Am I talking too much? No. <laughs> Absolutely okay. not. This is what um, I want. <laughs> this is what I want. I don't care what they want. This is what I want. <laughs> I'm looking back there and I see the guy going like. Uh. <laughs> Absolutely, I'm zoned in, man. Well, it's like it's it's getting weird now because it seems like everybody's doing comedy now. Yeah, everybody's doing it. Everybody's an open mic night guy. Everything you can go over to the Comedy Zone in Harrisburg mm -hmm. on open mic night, which is actually on a Thursday night, and they go, okay, we have um, uh, 45 comedians. Okay, I'm not sitting through the top 45 in history. Okay, I can't sit that long. Yeah. And people keep thinking they want a bunch of things like that. But and co but watching comedy is kind of like eating pancakes, you know? First three pancakes, great. After the third pancake, you don't want any more freaking pancakes. That's true. You know? It's true. And uh, and the problem is, too, is it doesn't matter if you go to open night, night mic night or anything. You can you can still call yourself a comedian, which which is like, okay, well, I, what do you do? Well, I'm a comedian. Uh, where have you before? Well, I go to open mic nights. If you were a doctor... Or you're practicing to be a doctor. You can't say you're a doctor. That's true. You know, it's the only job where you can say you do it and people have to go, oh, okay. Okay. So, uh, but there's so many of them and there's so many uh, things now that the people that are, that, that book all this stuff, they got to watch with a close eye because you have some of these guys in these clubs where they go, well, this guy has a million uh, views on, on, uh, on TikTok. TikTok. Oh, so we're going to bring him in because he's funny on TikTok. And anybody that's been doing this forever, you always can tell you that doesn't translate. And plus, you might have a million followers, but are the million followers where you are? You know? Valid point, you yeah. Know? Or, or are they regional, where, you don't yeah. know where they are. You know, it's nice to have a million. Okay, you have 10 million, then we'll put you somewhere. Yeah, that's a different story. Right. But a lot of times these people kind of go and they sit there and they kind of, they just kind of peter out with it. So. Um, you, you, they always have to be kind of careful with it, you know, because there's a lot of people that are going around. They say they're comedians. It's a little rougher now because of 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 the people and and, and I guess we'll say feelings. Yeah, the, the climate, but the climate of it now, and I don't think that's changed me though. Any, I think what happens is is I've just said like before, I'm just gonna be who I am. Yeah. If I say something along the way that offends you, okay. Um. Uh. Sorry, and then I'll just go, oh, well, I didn't mean to offend you, and then I'll just keep going on. But I'm not going to walk through some minefield. Yeah, and, and I think that's one thing, too. I mean, I'm not trying to get too edgy with my opinion here, but, like, I think one of the things that a lot of people have, like, forgotten recently, and this is my own personal opinion. This is not the opinion of anyone or any kind of organization that I work for, but my personal opinion is, like, people have forgotten that, like, you're allowed to be offended. Right. Like, you're fully entitled mm -hmm. to be offended. Right. Congratulations. You feel that you're offended – that's fine, but that's for you to work through and process. Mm -hmm. It's not up to everyone else to cater to you because you have been offended by this one thing. Like, I I'm just like, now, are there certain things? Like, obviously, like, there are known offensive things that mm -hmm. you just don't do. Yes, there, there, there's a, quite a few of those. But, like, if someone just says a joke that you just don't agree with, it's like, well, I'm triggered. Or, like, I'm offended. I'm like, congratulations. Like, thank you for letting me know. Mm -hmm. And you're entitled to that, that, that feeling, but that doesn't mean I have to change anything that I'm doing you can remove yourself from the situation. Right. I don't have to change myself. Well, that's the thing, too, because Jerry Seinfeld always used to say, you can do a joke about Hitler, but it better be funny. You know? <laughs> it's, it's about okay? the point, yeah. So, and, but, and the other thing, too, is that back in, here's how it used to work. There's a progression here. You know, you would go to a show, and you'd say a joke, and as a comedian, you never knew that, that the joke offended somebody because um, they, they would maybe never come back to the club because they were offended or they say to the manager or something like that. Yeah. And then that progressed to, okay, now I'm offended, okay, and now I'm going to yell that I'm offended. Yes. Okay, then that progressed to I'm offended, I'm going to get up and leave, and I want people to see me leaving. 
Okay, so now it's become more. I'm the main character, more, not more you. the main thing. Yeah. Um, I do some crowd work and everything, and that's shunned on here and there and stuff. But it it depends. People don't understand. I can't tell you how many times. I've done a show and some guy is sitting there and I'm just going on going on there and he'll say something and I make him look bad with and he'll come up at the end of the show and go, well, I was trying to help, you know, and it, it happens. It happens all the time. I was just trying to help the show. Is that, your, I, is that your name? Outside? Yeah. Well, this is, is what my I name? said. I, go, I always say to people, I go, well, you know, my, you know, my name's on the side. I don't mean to make it about me, but <laughs> it's kind of know, about it's, me. It's about me for like, for the next, next hour. Yeah, exactly you know? right. And, uh, but a lot of people, don't know and i think we're we're losing uh of uh, control of people being offended about stuff and it's like like i said i just go along yeah and i do what i do and if someone's offended about it and they want to tell me they're offended and i don't care if they tell me while i'm there we'll work it out while i'm there yeah but i'm not gonna tiptoe um through a minefield after years of just being myself and then all of a sudden i got to be really careful what yourself is you really can't get canceled it depends on what it is as long as you don't touch kids you pretty much that's pretty much kids and animals. That's it. Yeah, you're not you wrong. It yeah. doesn't matter what you, you say. What's the from here? Shane Gillis, for goodness sake. Perfect example. Yep. You know, he was he was he uh was performing and he was he had a cast spot on Saturday Night Live and they went back in some podcast he did forever and he did some remark about Asian people and then they said they they banned him. And well last weekend he ends up hosting Saturday Night Live. So yeah. I mean, so there's there's really no rules. I wanna be canceled. I want someone to get upset and film it. So I can go viral with it <laughs> because at this point, because at this point, almost canceling is almost like a, a springboard. Well, yeah, because like, it's like no publicity is bad publicity because no. it's like no. it's getting your name out there again. If you go out all the time, and I don't mean to sound jerk about it, but I have a pretty good success rate. My old model is is, is sold out shows, stand and O's. That's it, and it goes that way. But there's something to be said about just going on. Oh, that was great, and going home and being great. You know, people don't remember a lot of the stuff I do. But if I said something. Up there that offended somebody like years ago, I would say, hey, somebody go, hey, so uh, how many kids you got? And they go, well, you know, it's be two, whatever. Someone would they go, how many kids you got? I go, oh, they go three. I go, oh, one of each. You know, I just goofing around, you know, because it just sounded silly. Yeah. But nowadays you can't say one of each because they might have one of each. And uh, and but I even yeah. take the time. That I still do that. And I explain to them why it's hard to do it. And then they don't get mad at it. So would you, you know? say that this climate like. It could definitely be viewed as like a dilemma to writing comedy, but would you say for yourself personally, it's almost kind of given you more material to work with because it's it, it presents material in and of itself. Yeah. Like, well, mad bad makes good. Yeah. It's as okay. simple like that. that you know? That's a really good I mean, way. Of bad it. makes good. In 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 the in the big world, you like good people over bad people. But if you're watching wrestling, you probably like the heel. Because you know the good person's going to be good. The bad guy, you don't know what the heck he's going to do this week. That's true. So, I mean, it's, it keeps a certain mystery to it. And I, and I think you have to have some kind of badness in it to, to, to keep it legit and to keep people on their toes. Yeah. So, I mean, you have done, I mean, you've done a lot and you've definitely enlightened me in like, the process of writing comedy and like, what the, kind of like the inside world of like, comedy is. And I know I'm only getting like, a glimpse of the tip of the iceberg mm -hmm. of that world. But with that being said, is, is there any like dream collaborations that you would like to do with any other comedian? Is there anybody that you've ever worked with that was a dream? Uh, listen, I, well, I've worked with a lot of people. As far as writing uh, uh, with comedians and stuff, I, I'll tell you what, I don't even watch that much comedy. I only watch old school people that I that are so far out there that I will not be influenced by because that's okay. the whole thing too. There's a, a, a Shannon Sharp, you know Shannon Sharp. He had uh, the football player. Yeah, yeah he okay. has a yeah, podcast yeah. where he talks to Cat Williams. Oh, yeah. You know, when you're not looking at this one, check that out because <laughs> it does a whole thing on comedy. Okay, and and he's exposing people for stealing jokes and all this other stuff. Okay, so I don't like to look at people who aren't the bigger names because. I don't want to get influenced by everything because I'm I'm gone. I work off of pretty much what's in front of me or what comes in my mind. Yeah. I've been blessed enough to be able to do that. And if you've seen my show and see how I end the show, it, it's almost like magic because it's really weird on how I, I kind of bring it all together. Okay. But I don't watch anybody. Matter of fact, yesterday I was working in my office. And for the first time, I watched uh, uh, Burt Kreiser. Okay, yeah, the name, oh God, the name. The guy that the, takes the shirt off. Yes, okay, 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 yes, yes. So I, I, and I, and I watched him because he's all over the place. He is, he's like, he's blowing and, up right and now. And it's like, I've watched so much comedy that if I watch comedy, you know, I don't, 
any kind. I watch and I sit there, and I uh, uh, most comedians don't laugh. Most of us will sit there and go, "Boy, I wish I wrote that," you know. So you don't get a ha ha ha, you know, out of it. Out of the other comedians, right? right you but you go, "Boy, I wish I wrote that. That's clever. That's good." And that's what I do a lot. There's some things that make me laugh out loud, you know. There's some things that Chappelle does that I just. I just uh, um, laugh out loud about. Okay. But um, <laughs> but, but it's collaborating and everything. Like, I've worked with tons of other comedians. I um, um, worked with, like, Arsenio and, and, and just uh, and Jay Leno and a bunch of other people. I think it's hard nowadays because people are, uh, uh, like, your bigger name comedians are bringing mostly their friends along to be with them. Yeah. And they work with their friends because everything is, 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 is closed off. Yeah, they're keeping it when like their 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 family. Like if you look at a guy like uh, Joe Rogan, yeah, he's got a bunch of comedians. And they all move down to Austin. Yep, and and the bunch of people that he kind of hangs out with. So it's becoming um um very very clickish. And as far as collaborating and writing, anyone listen, I just want anything I do is so I can sell more tickets when I perform. I don't need a. I wouldn't want a sitcom. I wouldn't want any of that stuff. I would really? just want something that goes. I know that guy from something, you know, anybody that was an actor in the past that's not acting anymore. Yeah. When they were an actor, they should have taken up comedy because then they could have jumped on stage and lived off the fact that people remember him from like uh, like Todd Bridges, different strokes, like all these people. And you, you can live smart. off of that stuff, too. I mean, you know, uh, smart nostalgia. Mark uh, was it um, 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 uh, Mark Price? OK, yep. from Skippy yep. and, and Screech who passed away. They were the funniest guys in the world. But what happened is people come out because they basically want to stare at them. So you should be True. able to just come out and they go, okay, you want to stare at me? I'm going to give you a reason to stare at me. Not only are you going to know me from that show, but you're going to know that I'm hysterically funny. And that's how it should be. But, you know, a lot of these people go, well, I'm just an actor. I'm going to be an actor, an actor, an actor. And then when it starts to go down, then that's when they stand on, uh, do stand up. And then people go, eh, he's just trying to find something to do, you know. Your, your knowledge is, like, astounding. Like, you, you have such specific, logical answers for everything, and I love it, man. Like, it's just, like, so quick. I'm, like, still trying to process everything mm -hmm. as you're saying it, but, like, God, I, I love everything you're giving me. Um, And you've touched on, like, how, like, you just, the way you write and everything, like, the, the way you have to act, the way you have to handle all that, you are kind of known, like, you have legendary, like, improv skills. I mean, like you've said, you work at the CPMAs. I mean, if you're if you come to the CPMAs and you see the CPMAs, I mean, when they come and talk to you, I mean, you don't have a whole lot of time with each person, no. but you make every <coughs> single interaction memorable, like immediately. Like it's just like it's custom made content for each person. And like I remember when we talked to you last year, I think we gave you like two little bits of information. Like you knew we were the podcast, mm -hmm. and you knew what we were there for, and then bam, and you just. Custom. How do you do that, man? Like, well, how 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 does that work in your brain? I'm sure people are dying to know that. Well, it's it's hard because first of all, it's like you have to listen to people. You have to listen to it. And the hard part about that whole thing is, you know, you've got all these musicians coming up, yeah, and you don't want to go. Well, how'd you get started? How'd you get started? How'd you get started? So you have to break it up and everything. If I have a personal uh, experience. With them, you know, like uh, like if uh, uh, Olivia Fairball comes up, yeah, and I remember her because she used to come on a radio station and play, and then it makes it a little easier because you know these people. That's about point. But yeah. you know, when when I I'll ask them questions like, you know, so you know, Amber Nadine, that's your that's your mom, and you travel with your mom and blah blah, you know, and um, and then get into if they're being nominated for something or anything, and get into that part. I think people want to know more about the person, individual. That's why TMZ works so well because they want to know about the person. They know you sing such and such a song. They want to know, well, what do you do when you're not singing that song and that sort of thing. Yeah. So if you listen to somebody when they tell you that, for me, it just naturally comes to me on like, wow. So, you know, it's like, so your, is your hair really red? Why makes you red? What makes you like for me? I go to musician like like what makes your look? The cool thing about musicians is there's no protocol. There's there's no look. It's true. I don't have to dress up for the CMMA. Uh, CMA. I don't have to. I'm listening to CMA. It's country music. One. No. <laughs> but I don't have to dress up for it because it doesn't matter because you're there for the art. It's and true. people come in and they have expressive things and some people dress up and some people show up in the, in the, um, you know, in just uh, T-shirts and stuff. And so what I like about that, it's like, okay, so we're here for the music. You know, we're not here to, to, to impress each other with each other's clothing and stuff yeah. like that. So, 
I I just it's still astounding to me because I mean I I did I, I I grew up listening to you on mm-hmm. the radio and everything and I always I mean I'm not gonna lie there's always a there's still a small part of me but uh, there was always a part of me that wanted to be a stand up comedian I, uh, I think it I think for, for men for every guy thinks they're funny yeah they they all think they're funny you know what I've I've had people come up to me and um it, it, it's you know I was doing radio with somebody one time. And, um, you know, his his father had passed away, but he made a remark. You know, we were talking about how his father would watch uh, sports and he would get, he would yell derogatory things to the black people. So I would I, so I got on that and we just kept doing it. So after he passed on and my mother had passed on, too. And he's like, hey, you know, you think a mother and father, are, 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 you know, are, are have a chance of meeting in heaven. Do you believe heaven's that big? I go, your father ain't in heaven, blah, blah, you know, what everything else like that. <laughs> you know? He's up there burning up and everything and everything. My mother would. So I would go. We go back and forth with this every once in a while. And that could offend most people. You're not Never wrong. offended him until one day I said, oh, you're not funny. And it pissed him off. Pissed them off. And that was a thing that made him go, because every guy thinks he wants to be funny. Best way to meet women, have a sense of humor. Not That's wrong. the best way. Okay? So I guess guys know that, and they figure like, well, I'm I'm whatever, whatever. Or, or, or I could be a comedian and yeah. everything else like that. I mean, I've never gone to a pilot and said, I I could be a pilot, you know? <laughs> Let me fly this plane. Why don't you take a break, boss? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take it over this time. I can do that. You know, my friends say I'd be pretty, pretty good at it. <laughs> so I might just take it. the plane around. So... But yeah, it's 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 one of these things. But you say you were saying you thought that you could be a, a comedian. Now, well, what what made you feel that, and what made you stop doing it? So I never actually pursued it. It's always been something that's in the back of my mind. But I I used to write jokes down, like you know, the the very basic beginnings, like oh, like this is a really funny like actual experience that right. I interacted with. Or like I'd write those down. But I mean, I've lost those journals long ago. I've actually recently started thinking about writing it back down. But the reason why I'm saying like. I, when I was thinking about it when I was younger, like, you know, when the world's your oyster, the, the sky's the limit. Right. I was, you know, on my way to school and I would hear you on the radio and, stuff like that, and like I would hear someone say something that wasn't like that funny, mm-hmm. like at all, but you would just swing right in with that, without missing a beat and you would just spin that joke around and I was like, he made it funny and I'm like, that was always so impressive to me. I'm like, that's like that's where I want to get with it. That's, that's like the level that I want to get to but then obviously I focused on other things, you know, got a career, did other things. I got involved with music and so that. So the comedy stuff kind of went on the back burner. But right. I, I just like as someone that you know idolized like Jim Carrey, Robin Williams, mm-hmm. like some of the comedy greats. In in my opinion, right. um, I was like they're just fantastic. I I would I would just give anything to just even have like a sprinkle like of their talent. You know what I mean? And like their style, the way they did it, on um, their deliveries. Um, but like you were like like the same thing but like a local version to me like you were hilarious Mm -hmm. and you could spin anything instantly and i was like how how do i get to that level i remember literally walking off the school bus one time i do not remember what the joke was but i was like they were playing the radio and like as i'm (laughs) filing out of the the school bus i was like listening to what you were saying but i got to the door before you could get to the Mm punchline and i remember i literally was like damn it I was like, I wanted to know what the punchline was, well, <laughs> and, I, and it was you that I was listening to. I cannot remember for the life of me what the conversation was. Well, the but- hard thing about comedians being on radio, for one, is a lot of them, a lot of them do it, and it's hard because, like, um, first of all, comedians don't like to get up that early. They don't want to be through doing mornings. <laughs> they don't want to be up that early. <laughs> and second of all, you know, you go, okay, we're going to bring a comedian, and he's going to be part of this show. Well, if you can't make that transition between just being funny in your environment and your material, then you get screwed up because these guys go on there and they go, oh, I used up everything that I would use on stage, which doesn't make any sense. It's ridiculous. Yeah. So you have to make that transition to go, okay, well, I want to be funny enough without using anything I do on stage where if I'm funny enough in the radio, they'll go, well, I got to go see that guy. I got to go see him because if he's this way, then then he's going to be better. But it's sure. a two-way street. It kills you, too, because sometimes, you know, you're not stand-up comedy funny on radio. And then people go, well, I heard him on the radio. He can't be uh, all that good. That was literally going to be my next question. Yeah. Continue. Yeah. And I still have people that come to this day, you know, that um, – um, and uh, I must be pretty good at it because people are starting to hate me. And that's how you know. When I, I was younger you and you did something good, people would pat you on the back and go, good job and everything. But now – if you're successful, people start to hate you. We, we heck, we learned that a week ago or in the past couple of weeks with with Taylor Swift, you know. And and I'm sitting there going, well, we don't like. It. I'm going, well, she didn't. I mean, what'd she do? She didn't do anything else. She stood there at a game. 
Yeah. You know? Um, so it was, uh, uh, or like Travis Kelsey, when he bumped the coach, everyone's going, well, he should have been fired. He should have been kicked off and everything. And I'm like, look, if it ain't, Andy Reid doesn't have a problem with it, you should have a problem with it either. You're not Anybody wrong. Anybody that's ever been competitive knows in the heat of the moment, stuff changes. And it's what it is. It's in the heat of the moment. It's passion. It's a lot of, it's a lot of whatever. So people just go, oh, that guy's a jerk, whatever like that. You know, it's, no, this, look. This is this is the NFL, okay? Okay. This ain't your office, okay? That's true. It's not your office where the guy you go up and you bump into some guy hard to carpet you or whatever else like that. It's the NFL. There's a whole different other parameter, and people don't understand it. They keep thinking that all of that is like us, so they take all of that stuff and put it in everyday life, and it it doesn't it doesn't, it fit. doesn't match up the same. Yeah, that so doesn't fit the mold. I got people that'll send me some stuff that, that some stuff and. He goes, well, I don't think you're funny. And I, and I go, I, I don't like you. I don't think you're funny. And I'm going, well, the, 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 you, you got to – that doesn't affect me because I, the people show up. The people decide. Yeah. Okay? You can't send me a message um, and, and say, well, I don't think you're funny. And then the next night I'm at the Whitaker Center or Mickey's Black Box and it's sold out. Okay. It's weird. Okay. <laughs> one of these is not like the other. Yeah. One of these so is I wrong. Go, okay. Well, I'll go with, with the numbers thing. I got one the other day where this guy, this kind of got me. He says, I don't think you're funny. I wish you just kill yourself. And that made me, made me think. And I thought about it. And I was like, well, geez, you know, and I didn't think about it too long, but I went on Facebook and there used to be a restaurant in, in, in Pennsylvania called, and I, they're still out in Pittsburgh called Eaton Park. Okay, yeah. Eaton Park used to have those smiley face cookies yep, yep. with the smile. And I used to, I, you know, when I'm not training or anything, that's my go-to thing. And so I took a picture of one of the smiley face cookies, and it was in my phone. So after I got that, I posted that picture of just the, the cookie smiling, and I put under it, and I said, well, some guy just sent me a message and told me that uh, I should go kill myself. So I think this is a good time for me to re let people know if they have a problem with suicide or whatever, call 988, which is a suicide, suicide hotline. Suicide hotline, yeah. So I turn that around. So if I get the hate, I just turn it around into something Good positive. for you, man. And you'd be surprised the people that send me messages and stuff like that, and they go, boy, that was a classy thing to do, and and, and blah, 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 and everything. And, and even stuff I do, even yesterday was funky, because I'm sitting there at home, and uh, my doctor is in uh, uh, Elizabethtown. Okay. Okay. Um, and so I live over in Lewisbury. Okay. Yep. Okay. And I had to go and I was just sitting there and I was like, I just need to go to Elizabethtown and go across the turnpike, go 283, get off over that way. And, um, so I went to park, I went to go into a store and I had a park where well, they had parking meters where you had to throw change in and the, yeah. and the, and the woman's there marking stuff down. She looks at, she sees me and she goes, Oh, Earl, she goes, Earl, I know you're going to put change in there. So I said, okay, I got to put change in there. So I walked into this shop, and I said, listen, this is like so, like, 1980s, 1990. You have change for the meter because no one carries change out no, anymore. No, I don't. And I hate carrying it. It wasn't one of those kind where you – because some of them you can put your put card Put your card in. in and just put your license plate in. So I walk in there, and the woman sitting behind the, the desk um, sits there, and they're giving me change, and – she sits there and she stands up. She's staring at me, and I was like, "Okay, well, you know, maybe I'll take a picture or something." And she comes over to me and she she starts crying, and she says to me, "She goes, you know, she says, I got to tell you, I've seen you perform before, and I think you're one of the nicest guys in the world. My my mother was your biggest one of your biggest fans, and my mother passed away a few years ago, and um and one thing she 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 really liked about you when she was in the hospital." before she went in for the last time she was in the hospital just once and out of nowhere you just picked up the phone and you called her and i just you know i just call hi how you doing yeah. everyone else like that too and she never forgot that but she says and but, but the reason that i'm kind of upset is every valentine's day because that was my mother's favorite holiday every valentine's day she sends me a sign of something that reminds me of her and i and this is like in the afternoon and she says every year and she says i got nervous because this was about three o'clock in the afternoon and she's like man this day's over i'm not going to get my sign and then i walked in there and it was it was freaking heavy as hell my point being is you know you get someone to tell you to kill yourself and then you find out years down the road that you're doing the right thing you're doing it right you don't the people that reach out after seeing you perform 
it, there's a need for stand up. There's a need for people to go out there and bring some kind of joy and smile. To it. I don't do anything political on stage because first of all, I'm not smart enough to keep up with it. And second of all, everything's an escapism. Everything that you that makes you crazy will be there. I guarantee you after you leave and walk out from my show, it'll still be there. So let me give you a break from that and let's have a good time with it. I love that answer, man. I, I love that response. And also just like, that is crazy. Like that you were, it's, I don't want to say like you were used, but I mean that like in a good way. It's like you were a tool of like, of like destiny for someone. Right. And it's like, yeah, like why? Like I just got to go to Elizabeth town. Yep. I just got to go. And you park in front of that restaurant and it's, it's like crazy how that happens, but you're not wrong, dude. I, I definitely think as a fan of stand up comedy, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's super important. Um, and I also think right now, I, I don't know if you agree with me or disagree with me, but like, I think it's a critical for stand up right now because like stand up is getting scrutinized way too much mm -hmm. anymore. And it's like you you don't understand there has to be something that is allowed to make fun of everything and anything because how else do you get through like the bleakness of certain things? Like, right. Something has to be there has to be something that is. It, it it can't be off limits. Like it's a, it's a social pressure valve. Exactly. In other words, when when stuff builds up, you need to have something to turn to that goes and and bring the pressure down. You can say things that maybe I can't word properly, and right. you, you worded it perfectly, and it makes me laugh. And like you said, it's a valve. It's just like ah, as I laugh, that pressure just goes down, yeah. and it's just it's super super important. Yeah, I, and you just you just don't know who you kind of re reach with this too. But I mean, and it's a it's it's a it's a it's a fun thing. But yeah, so. I mean, Earl, I've got to say, it's been a pleasure going down like memory lane with you here. I do want to touch back on the CPMAs uh, here with you, though. I like to ask every guest, especially during some of our exclusives mm -hmm. here. You have worked in radio. You've worked in radio here. You've been a stand-up comedian all over the country. I mean, mm -hmm. you performed Atlantic City, Las Vegas, all over the country. But now you've done stuff with the CPMAs, and you do it every year. You're the spokesperson here. What have you noticed that is so special about Central PA when it comes to music? Well, first of all, it's, it's a big music scene. I, I, I have a, a tendency to look at um, uh, l l like the people that follow it. In other words, when tickets go on sale, mm -hmm. by the way, the Hershey Theater, I played Hershey Theater. Mm -hmm. Nothing's better than standing on that stage with a bunch of people packed in there. I can believe okay? it. Okay, so when I look online and they keep posting how fast these tickets are going, Okay. Now you could look at it one of two ways. You could look at it as, well, you know, these a bunch of narcissists want to sit there and do that, or you could look at it and go, okay, well, for all the bands that are there, they're not making up the whole contingency of the people that want to see it. Exactly. And the people will come out and they'll pay the ticket and they'll come in and see it. And what it tells me is, you know, um, there's there's places I never even uh, knew of. I didn't know of uh, uh, what is it, Inglewood? Yeah, Ingle the Inglewood. Yeah. I didn't know about the Inglewood. Okay, and the next to be one fair, they are pretty pretty new in the grand scheme of right. things. Right, and Mickey's is, is relatively it's, it's new relatively too. new as well. Um, so but but uh, um, well, quickly, got a side note. I'm sorry. Uh, no, absolutely. Uh, side note. So Mickey, I'm getting ready to play Mickey's, and so they're gonna film at Mickey's uh, last November. So I have a, a like a, a promotion, a production meeting from six to eight. Yeah, okay. I get out there to producers out there and 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 um, um, filming this and stuff because, um, uh, I was trying to do something with Netflix but I was like you know what I think I just want to produce my own thing and just and just deal with it yeah um so we had this production meeting and it was like uh 6 30 it was like 6 to 8 so about 7 30 I go look you guys don't need me anymore so let me just leave so I leave and uh the uh the, pr the production guy calls me up or sends me a, a, a text he goes boy you shouldn't have left so early and then he sends me a picture and it's him standing there with Steven Tyler Okay. Oh my god. Because if you know anything about the about Rock Lidditz, yeah, everybody in the world goes through Rock Lidditz. Yes, they do. And I guess uh, they were out there rehearsing and everything, yep. and and I was like, oh man. So I missed out. Um, I missed out on that. But uh, but so but I don't know about Rock Lidditz until I go and I hang around in the environment where all the where the music is. Yeah. I don't think people understand the talent. And the bands that put on a a, a a big show, I'm a big Jess Zimmerman fan. Okay, uh, yeah. big time. So, and that's no disrespect to anybody else because I'm amazed by everything. Yeah. When I watch, when I went to these musicians, and I watched that, it reminded me back in the, the day when I was a young person. My mother used to play piano for the church. Okay. 
and she says, you need to learn how to play piano because you have to play for the Lord, blah, blah, blah. blah. I said, kid, I don't want to play no piano. And I'm telling you right now, I'm trying to learn now because I see how phenomenal of an instrument it is and how wonderful music is. And uh, I just want to be able to play one song. I don't even know what this song is to be able to have uh, uh, in the act, just to be able to have it. Because I got spoiled because I went to see Elton John and that guy's all over the place. I mean, you, you probably picked one of the most iconic uh, yeah, and living, I, and I, living piano and I, artists. And I love him and I'm just sitting there watching him and I'm going, that's just, that's I mean. Billy Joel. It's like all these guys and all these guys that play, um, that play piano, you know. And then I saw a video of um, Tommy Lee playing drums for Kickstart My Heart. And I look at that and I go, it's ridiculous. Ridiculous. I, I could never play drums. I, I always <laughs> respected drums. I, I can't do it. Can't do it. Like I just I'm not coordinated enough. I'm mm -hmm. I'm all I'm all in symmetry. I can't well, I can't do the breakup. <laughs> like, I, I watched it. I said it and I see kickstart my, my heart and it had that start when it gets slow and he's like that's probably so he can rest. He's <laughs> all over the place. He's just sitting there going and they go, turn, you guys to start up again. But it's funny, I learned piano, I go, my problem is uh I have too many fingers. I feel if I were to lose some in some kind of a tractor accident, which is possible here in Pennsylvania, and lose a couple of fingers, I probably could be a, a better player. I tried to take lessons for a while. Um, I can't remember the gentleman's name, but he was really as patient as he possibly could be with really. He belonged to a, a, another band from around here called Yam Yam. Okay, love Yam Yam, and he played. Love and Yam he Yam. played. He played piano on Yam Yam, and I was like, okay. And he was teaching me lessons for a while out there. In, in Mechanicsburg, and um, and uh, I I I uh, didn't follow through with that, but I keep regretting it. And then COVID came, and I was like, that's when I should learn it. If I learned during COVID, I could probably play my one song. You know, I would I would hope one song through all of COVID. You know what it is? We all planned every list. Listen, look, I'm in great shape. I have grained 50 pounds, like everyone said they were gonna work out. You know, and they didn't do that. So it's true. Um, but but it's hard. It's 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 just one of those things where I sit there and go, man, I just have to be able to find some way to be a part of it. It's like when you watch comedy, you go, God, how can I, I want to learn? How can I be? How can I be closer to that? Yeah, I don't even have to be that. I just have to be find my way to be closer. Now, how do I get? Not even in the circle, but at least hang around on the outside. Yeah, of the circle. Can, can I can I stand around the right, circle? Exactly. And so music is the, is the, is the same way for me. So I, I think um, if you uh, get a chance, I'm, I don't know if there are any tickets left uh, to come out there and see the the this, this, um, the awards. But here's the thing: I you know what? I should just look at the damn glass that's in front of me. <laughs> see, so keep this, by the way. Sure. Yeah, that, that means I wasn't supposed to ask that. It's okay, fine. It's, it's all right. I'll take the Dixie cup in the bathroom. Um, I, I got a marker. I can put that word. But no, but it, it's like, um, I, if you if you get a chance, go out and see some of these some of these these bands. Uh, it, it's just it's just amazing. They're just just phenomenal and fantastic. And uh, and every time I show up somewhere, I had to perform in in Shippensburg out towards the Lures. Yeah. And then I went into some small place afterwards, and I can't remember who I saw, but I remember meeting her at the award show. And it was like, wow, you know, and we're sitting there and we're we're talking. There's a lot of there's a lot of talent out there. Yeah, and I, I always people sometimes ask me like they, they tell me to flip the script on me, like, well, what do you think is so special? And I'm like, it's got to be the water with TMI. Like, it's got to be something from TMI, <laughs> just changing the genetics or yeah. something. Years <laughs> ago, I came out here to perform at York College. Okay, a thousand years ago. And uh, and I remember going over the South Bridge mm -hmm. to get to 83 South, as I know it now, and get to York. And I remember looking over there, and I would see TMI, and I go, what kind of fool would live out here? And now I'm one of the pod people, you know? <laughs> yep. I'm actually over there driving by. Oh, that ain't nothing, you know? And That's it's, just our local cloud factory. Oh, no, <laughs> no, yeah. But it's like, it's like I think if you get a chance, you should be able to, uh, like, love drafts. All these places. Yeah. Uh, um, you know? Um, where if, if music, check out the local scene. We know what the big, huge names can do, all right? Come out and see some of the people. Music is hard because it's like, you know, if you're a cover band, you know, it's like, well, I'll play a song, and everybody knows that song, and we'll mm -hmm. jump up and we'll sing that song. It's got to be hard as hell to play something original and get that to catch on because I can imagine, you know, you're a cover band, and you go, hey, we're playing like that. All right, now we're going to play one of our songs. Well, let's go to the bathroom. Nobody, you know, nobody cares until someone yep. tells you you're supposed to care. Exactly you right. Know.
I got, I, I, and I'll tell you, man, like, just like it, it is hard. I was one of the people that lived it, and I, even when I say it now, it's the weirdest thing. Like when I played and the style that I played, mm-hmm. like the biggest compliment you could get, like you knew you were doing well, is if that breakdown started mm-hmm. and you watched everyone else punch each other in the face Mm -hmm. you're like i'm doing a great (laughs) job and it it was saying that now it just sounds so weird but it's like if that dude's punching the other dude in the face you know you're killing it and it's like ah but you're not wrong i mean it it does takes a lot of courage um and like i'm telling you right now i just got done actually recently judging the uh, youth music showcase right these young artists they are Killing it. Well, how There's... hard is that to judge something? Are we, you know, we, we, in the radio business, they hate those battle of the bands because we oh. got ripped off. Everyone got ripped off, you know. I, I'll tell you what made it hard was that they were all so good. So like, right. we had to critique, which, like, don't get me wrong, there was something somewhere that everyone could learn something. Mm-hmm. But there was like one or two that I, I'm telling you, watch our episode of the Youth Music Showcase with, with the interviews of some of these guys. Um, and go see them. Mm-hmm. But there was like one or two that I literally was, they were like, all right, Alan. And I was like, I, I got I got okay. nothing. Like you are flawless, like where you're at right now. And like some of these people are like 15, 16. And I'm like, how? Like I, I, I wasn't even like writing yet when mm-hmm. I was 15 or 16. And you have already perfected something. So like I don't, I'll be right there with you. I don't know what it is in this area, but there is definitely something special here. And Whatever it is that's fueling it, it it keeps transcending down the generations. Like it just it keeps going, and I love. It. And I I chalk it up to community. I chalk it up to the support that we have here. I mean, there's just there's so there's so much here for musicians. There there just really is. I, I always when I look at musicians, I always go, man, that's got to be a rough life because I'm one guy. I get on stage and I go, okay, and they go, and at the end of it, we'll talk money here for it for a little bit, and they pay you your money, and then I go, okay, so you now you're in a band. Okay, you get up there, you're four other guys, uh, you know, and the money that they might be playing me might be a ton of money, but when you break it down for four guys, it's less, and then you got to put money back in for the equipment and all this other kind of stuff. It's a it's a rough existence, <laughs> or it's or it's not a large amount, right? And you still have to split it four or five ways. And I only have to deal with me. In other <laughs> yeah. words, it's like you know you got you, you get together with with pray, and that's how strong the human nature is and 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 people getting along that's how strong it is and people go well you know it is that that's people having a belief different than somebody else is so strong well look you, you, you're in you're in you're in van halen and you can't play together you know can you imagine <laughs> yeah. being that pissed off and go listen i know we're stars but i can't stand you okay i'm just gonna get out of this band that's and, actually and, a very valid point yeah, yeah. so i'm sitting there go so so that's why you go wow so it, it it's got to be your your craft has to be bigger than you. You always have to be in your craft, whatever, whether it is like comedy or whatever. You always have to be reaching for something, you know. Because if you're not reaching for something, you're just reaching across. You'll never respect it, and then you'll you'll let it you'll get let it go because you go, well, it's right there. Why am I gonna you know do any extra for it? And so that's what's so hard, and that's why, like playing, like when I got to play Atlantic City, I knew that was a pinnacle. When I got to play. Vegas, that was a pinnacle. My best Vegas story was. Uh, I, w- I was going to ask. Oh, so, well, please. I was in Atlantic City and I worked with um, um, Jimmy Walker. You know who Jimmy Walker is? The name is, the name you know, is familiar. JJ from Dynamite, whatever. This is oh, yeah, 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 okay. yeah. Okay. So, so back in the day, Jimmy Walker was the highest paid guy on television from the show Good Times. Yep. He made so much money that it was hard for uh, Esther Roll, who was the mother to figure out, you know, then they, they would go to CBS and, and John Amos would go to CBS and they would almost bitch and moan about it um, because this kid's making so much. This kid at yeah. like 19's making, uh, making a ton of money. Highest paid guy on TV. And those guys were like, uh, uh, were like you know, season actors. Yeah. You know. Like they paid their dues. Like right, they, right. They, they deserve yeah, to be here. You know, and so sitcom for actors that are that special and stuff, like they were like in Roots and all this. Those kind of actors... The sitcom's almost like almost like a little funky for them, yeah. Because it doesn't um, 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 give them their just due. Perfect example. Um, there used to be a show called The Munsters. You guys remember The Munsters? I do remember, remember The that? Munsters. Yes. And Fred Gwynn that played yep. Herman Munster. Yep. Big Shakespearean actor, big time Shakespearean actor, but could never get out of it because everyone knew him as Herman Munster. I went to see him play Hamlet one time. Really? And he got out there and he was rolling and rolling, and somebody went. <laughs> like 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 her mother he walked off and did not come back and i thought to myself 
good for you. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, 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 I always believe like, listen, no matter what happens, you got to go through with the show. But it's like that guy, you know, he really couldn't escape it. No, he couldn't escape that. But now when I was in Las Vegas, uh, uh, but we're actually going back to Atlantic City. I'm sorry, Jimmy Walker. Yeah, I had to perform with Jimmy Walker. But Jimmy Walker had gotten older and everything. So he was just hosting the show and I was kind of headlining the show. And people would come up to him and, and, and afterwards he was selling photos of him, his old school photos with the hat, holding the sticks of dynamite in the yep. picture. He was selling his photos for $10 a piece. Now, back in the day, you know, when you had your promo photos, I mean, I had them. I just sign them and give them away because it's just part of the business. Yeah. But he was signing them and selling them um, uh, for, for 10 bucks. Now you don't even get the people to sign the pictures because you're better off standing there taking a picture with them. Yeah. And uh, and people would come up to him and say, say Dino Mike. And he said, you have to pay me to say that. You have to actually pay me to say that. And what people don't understand about Jimmy Walker is that he did his show long before this whole residual thing happened. Yeah. In other words, like Kevin James um, makes a ton of money on King of Queen reruns, tons of it. Yep. Uh, you know, money he probably won't even get to spend because of a whole residual deal yep. of, a, of a syndication deal, rather. Um, of doing 100 episodes and stuff. But yep. they didn't have that deal back then. So, you know, I worked with him and I... Something and, so iconic and he's making absolutely no money on it. Yeah, and I said, and I sat there and I talked to him for a while. And he was a little crispy. You know, he's a little crispy about it. But, you know, overall, I remember him just sitting there and going, saying, listen, don't let this business use you. Don't let it use you. And, and he said that, and that's such a vague statement. I don't know what that means. Yeah. You know, someone could go, hey, you want to be in a, in a, a show and uh, as a black person, you got to play a slave? You know, is that using you or is that you doing your craft? Because what happens a lot of times is, you know, we look on that kind of the spectrum, you know, some people, some black people might go, well, you shouldn't do that. We can't take those parts. And you're going, well, maybe I need to take the part because I have to. I have to eat. Yeah, I have to eat. Like so, I, I need a place to live. Right. So, and Jimmy Walker was in the classic example of not being in anything else after good times. I think he had a cameo in one of the airplane movies. Or yeah, something like that, mechanic or something like that. Yep. You know. Um. So, but then when I played uh, Vegas, I played. I was playing the Riviera Hotel. And uh, the Riviera is no longer. I don't know if you've been to Vegas. Oh, uh, I've I've been to Vegas. Yes. <laughs> okay. So they're they're it's all all over the place. Yep. I used to play the Tropicana, uh, but they're tearing the Tropicana down. Oh, really? Okay. They're gonna tear the Tropicana down. They're gonna put a baseball field on that corner and another new hotel on the other side of it. Because okay. The Oakland Lays are gonna have a minor league team coming in there. Oh, and that's awesome. Be, Vegas has become a big sports town now. Yeah, I mean, especially you know? with the Knights and everything. That kind of, like, yeah. skyrocketed. Yeah, it. And, and that and the Raiders and everything. But yeah. I was playing Vegas at the Riviera that wasn't there anymore. And uh, I was performing. And the Las Vegas Journal Review, or Review Journal, I think Review Journal is, uh, would come out during the week because you would get there and you'd go uh, 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 Monday night to Sunday and then leave on the Monday if you're there for a week. But they'd come out on like a Wednesday or a Thursday and look at all these shows. And then for the Thursday night, they would write what shows you want and what shows you need to see while okay. you're in town. So I remember uh, they saw my show at the Riviera and they, 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 they picked me this years ago. And I was like, wow, I can't believe it. Oh, one of the shows you would need to see. And I'm sitting there going, boy, this is pretty funky because the other shows you need to see were like David Copperfield and all this other stuff and everything. And you're right up there. And with I, was, other I was in this thing where they're going, well, we, we like this show and we, we saw it. And I thought, why are you coming to see me? And the guy just said to me afterwards, he go, we, we just put, we just do who's going to entertain us. We don't deal with names because people come to town. They want to be entertained. OK, that's a valid so point. We, we we don't care. We know they're going to go see whatever, whatever, whatever. But maybe they don't have enough for that, whatever, 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 stick it. And they go, well, let's go to the comedy club and, you know, or let's go to this comedy show. Yeah. So um, if you have Celine Dion in Vegas, like we already know Celine Dion's going to sell tickets. Unbel yeah, exactly. It, it, so it's exactly. like, OK, cool. You know? We don't have to worry about that. And, and it's funny because I was there and I remember picking up that that paper. And my agent at the time goes, hey, man, listen. He goes, this is great. It's great. And I didn't know what a big deal it was. And I said, well, what did they say? Uh, he has a lot of chariz charisma. Um, Earl David Reed is a, uh, it said, uh, he's a um, uh, urban, urban style Don Rickles, they said. So I okay. go, okay. So I go, all right, that's fine. So I go on and I go the rest of the week and everything and people come out with this show because they're reading this thing and I and that's not in the Don Rickles as much as I work off in front of you. There's a fine line between 
working off what's in front of you and you making fun of people. And people yeah, I feel like that's a knife's edge. They can't take, and they can't tell the difference. So, like, if you say, "Oh, well, I'm a pilot," and you do something funny about pilots, a lot of people are going, "Well, he made fun of me." No, I'm making fun of the idea of the, you know, yeah, exactly I, of the concept. Bottom line is, I don't really know you. Okay, <laughs> so I'm, I, I'd be an, I'd be, can I say asshole? Yeah, you should. Can. Okay, I'd be an asshole, asshole, to be able to come up to people and go, um, "Oh, you're stupid," or "You're dumb," or whatever. You know. Yeah. So you know. So it's all in fun, and my age group gets it. Like most people that come see me now are in the upper demographic. They're okay. not these 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 thin skinned kids that you know, um, you know, they're gonna have a heart attack because they they don't have a signal, you know. I got you, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So now it's I'm I'm going with grown people like 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 I mean us like real grown people like we're so old, like when we back out of a space we don't even look anymore. We just go. We go, listen, you know, Send it. it's up to the young people to look for us now. We've turned our head enough. We're just going to back out of this space. And so I was there and I uh, was doing the show. And then Saturday night, the guy that manages the club comes up to me and he's a big Italian guy. He goes, I want to see you after the show in the office. So I go, oh, my goodness. And by the way, this big guy was a guy named who was running the Riviera at the time was a guy named Steven Sharippa. Why and Steven Sharippa played Bobby on The Sopranos. Okay? Oh, my God. So isn't this, isn't this world funky and small? <laughs> yeah. So he ended up being a guy that 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 uh, w was in The Sopranos. And I don't know if you've seen The Sopranos before, right? I've seen bits and pieces. Okay. He's probably the, the nicest out of all of them, pretty much. You know? Yeah. Uh, until he had to be bad, and then he was bad. But um, So he said, I need to come in the office and everything. So I was like, oh, my goodness. So I'm performing, performing, and performing. I go into the office and uh, sit in a chair with a newspaper and with that magazine article in front of his face is Don Rickles. So I walk in there and he's sitting there and he's acting like he's reading this article about me. And he goes, he goes, oh, look at this. An April style Don Rickles. He's like, he sees me in the ground. And Steve goes, um, uh, Mr. Rickles, this is uh, Earl David Reed. And he goes, uh, hey, how you doing? Oh my God, he's black. You know, <laughs> and then he goes, he goes, I'm look, I love you. I kid you. I kid. And he hugged me. And after he hugged me, he starts patting himself down, you know, <laughs> so he never, never, never was, uh, never was off and everything. That's awesome. So I got to meet him. And then years later, he was playing, I guess there's a place called the Sands in Allentown up that way now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he was there. But by the time I had seen him, because I had seen him a couple of times and they would invite me um, out to the show and I got a picture somewhere. I'll have to send you of me on stage with him because he invited me up on stage. Oh, but that's the time awesome. I saw him, he, he was he was sitting in his chair by he was sitting in the chair by then. Okay. Because he couldn't move as much yeah. as he could. But uh but that's something. I think the cool thing about this business and uh even like with the music and even whether it's comedy or music, I can guarantee you if you bring any of these musicians that um that um you have at the we have at the award show. They're all going to have a really cool story that they can share. Absolutely. I mean, everyone's going to have a story. And the cool thing about this business is your story can change. Yeah. It could change. You know, we, At I, any I, given it, moment. Yeah. I mean, it, it could be like, okay, I have the Don Rickles story. But my goodness, I walked into the store and there was so-and-so whatever talking to me. So it's, it's what's interesting about this, this business. And if I can tell anybody else that music-wise and all these people you see, the reason why they're where they're at is because they didn't quit. You can't you can't quit because the day you quit, the next day might be the day that something's going to happen. And that should be enough to keep you going. Absolutely. OK. And you can't look at what everybody else is doing either, because that'll make you nuts. A uh, okay? hundred percent. It'll make you crazy. You just have to keep your blinders on and, and, and do it is what you do. So, yeah. Can we I just want to say this real quick. Cause you've been in Vegas. I've, I've been in Vegas multiple times for multiple periods of time. Can we just agree that their road system makes no sense? What so I was even using a GPS mm -hmm. and I almost got lost because like if we're here in Pennsylvania, right, right, and you have to take exit seventy two, mm -hmm. and you look over your mile marker, you're like, oh, I'm at marker seventy. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have two miles mm -hmm. until my exit. You're in Vegas. You're like, okay, my exit's eighty six coming up. Mm -hmm. You look over at your at your mile marker, you're like, okay, I'm at mile marker, I don't know, fifty four. Mm -hmm. You're like, okay, I've got a good bit to go. It's like eighty six is in two miles, and I'm like, what? And you're gonna pass exit forty seven. And then 32, and yeah. now it's 86. I mean, it's out of order. Who yeah. designed this? I'm like, Dr. Seuss, did he design well, the highways well, here? The funny thing <laughs> about it is it's it goes streets and avenues, okay? And I like to, I, when I go to Vegas, I rent a car. Yeah. People say, well, why do you rent a car? 
And I said, well, I rent a car because if I want to go get like bottled water, I drive over to Walmart, bring a case up to the room. I'm not paying eight dollars a bottle like like you do there. It's so true. Some things you're able to get off the strip and be able to do that. But going up and down the strip. Uh, it, you know, they actually had a Grand Prix race in Vegas. Yeah, I, I heard about that. And, and you, you know, uh, they, they probably got the idea of just the everyday people driving there because it's just, <laughs> yeah. it's just ridiculous. But it's like one of these things where I can go there for a while and then after a while I get burnt out with it. You know, 100%. It's like, it's like okay, um, I, I've, I've had enough of this. I had to be there you know? for a month for uh, a training event and everything. Oh. And I was like, don't get me wrong, it was awesome. It's like, okay, I'm – Cool, I'm getting paid to be in Vegas, mm -hmm. and like I'm being put up for free. But after a month, I mean, the problem is it's 24/7, 365 tourist pricing, and it, it can it can burn you out because like yeah, I'm getting paid, but I'm like somehow I'm still losing money and I'm not even gambling. Well, the, like, it's like, funny because the good thing about Vegas though is like like if, if if you're an NFL fan, and now they have football on there. The cool thing about Vegas was this: most people come in go Sunday, and they go home Sunday. Yes. they go Sunday to Sunday. They bring an NFL team in, and now. People are going Sunday, leaving Monday because they save for a game. Yep. Or if they play Monday night, then they don't. They leave Tuesday. Those extra days, that extra hours, bring in so much more so revenue. So much money for people that are staying. And if I'm like up in the middle of nowhere, like Buffalo, and my team's playing the Raiders, I'm going to the game. I got a vacation and I get to see a game. And it's what's true. interesting about the stadium there is, um, everyone's transient, so they're not going to kill you. Like if you go to Philly. Yeah. And you have you like you have anything on but Go green, birds. you know, and they, they'll, they'll <laughs> yeah. kill you, you know. Yeah, we're we're the best worst fans. Oh my goodness, it's like it's unbelievable. And Buffalo's not bad too, because I was spending a lot of time up that way too. And it's like, man, I, I you ever been to Buffalo, New York? I have not. Let me tell you something. Don't go. It's the worst. It's <laughs> it's the it's the it's I never seen so many people so proud of so little. It's it's just oh the weather's horrible the, the, and I was in Rochester okay, okay which is not even Buffalo yeah so they have to live vicariously through Buffalo and everyone's a Bills fan and every year they think they're gonna win the Super Bowl and every year they don't and it's like you know it's like you gotta let that rinse dream and repeat go. every year yeah you gotta let that <laughs> dream go and they had a kicker this year missed one kick again they were it's just oh, so horrible but uh, <laughs> even the stadium in Vegas has um uh they've got two fields that are set on these giant trays and they slide one big, the whole field, they slide it out if it's grass and they keep it outside so they can water it and everything and whatever. And they use the grass they slide in for the NFL and they have UNLV plays their football games there and they use the turf for that. So it's like two drawers that slide in. in That's in crazy. Thing. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. But uh, yeah, I, I, I like there. I like performing just about everywhere. And I was telling this gentleman over there, this gentleman over here as I was coming in, um, you know, when you when you tour, like I tell this and I'll tell bands this too, people always go, well, when are you going to play um, um, Cleveland? So I go, all right, well, uh, I'll play Cleveland or whatever. But I usually don't go and play the huge cities. I do once in a while. Yeah. But I don't. Because why do I want, why would I, you know, don't I don't want to play Cleveland because I don't want to be like, well, should we go see Earl David Reed or go see the Cavaliers or go see the Browns or the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame or all this other stuff? That's true. It. So my advice to you folks is if you're traveling and everything, book 50 miles outside that town, go into the middle of nowhere where there's a theater, where the town is like six, seven thousand people and you get 500 people that are going to show up just because they're looking for something to do. And then the people that live in that big city, if they want to see you, they'll come there to see you. That's about you go point. to small America because when you go to big America, they show you what they like that what the media wants you to see. In other words, and your biggest fans are going to come from the small towns anyway. That's Absolutely. where they're going to come from. People in the big cities, they go, oh wow, they're Seinfeld, they're whatever. They're 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 jaded because they'll watch the TV and tell you what's happening. These uh, people will watch you and follow you religiously. That's why you need to go to the smaller town. Guess what? It's a small town, but they still pay uh, American money. It's the weirdest thing, Al right? For, except for Alabama. Other than that, is <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> but other than that, it's like you go and 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 that's the, the the secret to a lot of that. Yeah, and that's how you go when you when you tour. Absolutely. You know, because people look for something to do. You know. Well, Earl, I gotta say. I just got to take this moment and say thank you. I mean, just listening to you, you've literally taken me on like a whole journey and somehow you still wrap it up. It's, it's almost like you're doing a bit right now. It's almost yeah. like it's almost like you're an expert at doing this now. Uh, but I want to say thank you for taking the time.
come down and sit with us, but also thank you for being involved with like our organization and lending your name and your legendary status to it. I mean, it definitely helps whether I'm sure, you know, it helps. I mean, but I just, I'm humbled that you have taken the time to come down and sit and talk with us and you have joined our organization and lend your name to it. Cause anything that helps us grow and get bigger and get more recognition and help the artists and the industry and everyone here. I mean, I, I love it. Well, you know, like I said earlier, everything that I've gotten in this life has come from the be able to be able, be able to stand on stage and stuff. So I use that to l utilize it. When I told the story earlier about meeting the woman in the store, my brother lives in Atlanta and he goes, man, he goes, you're a vessel, man. You're more than that. You're a vessel. You, you take this over here and take it over here and you take it where it needs to be. Now, listen, I don't know what you believe in, whether, you, whether you're spiritual or karma or whatever it is that we're all believing in now, but there's something to be said about about um, um, all of that. There's something to be able to, to be able to spend it. My advice is like, listen, it doesn't have to be comedy. It doesn't have to be music in this situation. It is because we're talking about it. But you need to find out what you're good at. Find out if you're a young person. Find out what you're good at and make it your bitch. You just take that and you own it. Just own it. Don't spend the rest of your life doing something you hate. There's a difference between a job and a career. Okay, a job's something you have to do to keep the roof over your head. So whether it's music or whatever, find out what you do and just get really good at it. If you're good at it, no matter what it is, someone will pay you to do it. That's a valid point. Yeah. Thank you so much. I mean, I feel like the knowledge that you have it just can flow forever. I wish we could do like well, a, a listen, double exclusive. I got here. a real big headache now. By the way, so. <laughs> no, uh, but here's the thing. I want to tell you this. Let's just um, Earl David Reed. Um, just follow me. Just Google me. It'll pop up like a rash. Some of the things I got coming up is uh, later in the year. Actually, in, I'm at the uh, Allen Theater in uh, in April. I believe it's April 20th. You can catch me at the um, uh, the Appel Center on November 16th, and I believe on the 17th I'll be at Mickey's Black Box. So um, those are big theater shows. But listen, I'll go where there's people. I've showed up in the middle place. I've been to a place called Forksville, Pennsylvania. Anyone know where that is? Forksville. I do not. You go to Williamsport. Take a right, and it's in the middle. They, they don't even have a signal. You you get 15 miles, like 15 minutes near this town, the signal goes out. And this person called me up years ago and goes, listen, um, I know you perform there, and I know you don't want to come up here, and uh, whatever. So I go there every year, first weekend in February every year, 300 people pack into this place, and it is. So it doesn't matter. That's the other thing, too, you have to understand, too. It doesn't matter what the name is on the place. Name looks good. It's about the number of people that'll come in that place, you know? Yep. If you go, hey, I'm playing a blah, 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 blah theater, okay? But uh, 300 people will, will um, you know, come into Joe's Crab Shack, play, gro you know, like I said, the money is Money the same. is money. Yep, absolutely. That's exactly right. We'll, we'll be sure to tag all of your all of your socials uh, yep. in the uh, in the link then. Mm -hmm. um, but, Earl. Well, let me tell you before we leave. Absolutely. Right. No, I want to thank, thank you. I want to thank you for everything that you guys do and everything that you put in there because it's easily it's easy to take something and just go, eh, let it go or let it die. You know, passion is so important, and and those are going to be the people that that survive because you're going to have they're going to have passion for whatever they do. I am so uh, happy and proud that I was even asked to be a part of this organization, and so um, I wish you the best. And uh, even though I don't get a mug, fine. Don't need a mug. Don't need a mug. We'll work something out. We'll work something out. I promise. <laughs> Joe Rogan would have given me a mug. He would have hit me in the head with it. Joe Rogan <laughs> also signed a two hundred fifty million dollar contract. So if Joe Rogan for, wants to uh, send some of that money for, this way, I'll for, get you fifty for mugs a, for a podcast. Can you believe oh, it's this is the great wildest country. thing? If you, listen, you can't find any way to make it work in this country. You don't need to belong here. I'm not saying you have to leave, you know, because I won't get in that mess. Stay so. tuned for next week's guest, Joe Rogan. I'm just kidding. I wish, <laughs> <laughs> but and I'll be here as a <laughs> in a headlock. So. <laughs> but Earl, thank you so much. I appreciate all of your time. And uh, everyone, you know where to find us, right here on the podcast when you're looking for the next great guest. I just want to take another moment to thank Earl David Reed for taking time out of his busy schedule to come sit down with us on the podcast. I hope you enjoyed listening to his story just as much as I did. As always, thanks for watching. Don't forget to follow us on all of our socials, and we'll see you next time.